I just want to keep this atmosphere going right now. And we'll deal with the announcements and the um, offering and the tithes and offerings later. Thank you, Jesus. Just give a moment to the Lord here. We've been talking a lot on setting the atmosphere in the city. And uh, I just had a picture just now, or a vision of God's people. They don't realize how much you, or how much they are involved in setting the atmosphere. If you know anything about meteorology, what causes rain to fall down? What causes clouds to form? And what causes you know, the changes in the atmospheric pressures? Well, you'll find that if you get closer to the coast, that it's rainier than it's when you go more inland. What happens, there's a thing called evaporation and convection. What, uh, what um, evaporation does, it sends water into the air or into the atmosphere. And when you look at the worship and the praise of the saints of God. They are involved in setting the atmosphere by their worship, their praise, and their adoration of their God. And how much we engage ourselves. We have this, uh, um, I guess, slogan we have for 2014. I don't know what else to say. I don't like those kind of words. But uh, for 2014, I'm not sure how long it's going to hang in there with, the, uh, you know, with this church. And the vision is to be authentic, engaging, and supernatural. I mean, even Jesus says, you don't know where the wind is blowing from. You don't know how the wind blows, but you still feel the wind. And that is what spiritual life is when, when uh, Nicodemus came and said to him, you're like, uh, how do I be born again? But it's not of flesh and blood, but it's of the Spirit of God. And how we walk in the Spirit is how we, we engage into the atmosphere. We're, we're singing today, let the windows of heaven open. And that is... Uh, it is, is equal or it uh, lines up with how we as people engage into the atmosphere and what we do and how we live our lives and how, we, how much we believe in, in what Jesus said. Because even he said, you know, worship is going to be springing out from the depths of the being of, of the people. Springs of water are going to gush out those springs are there to establish the atmosphere of the, of the area that you're in, of, of, your, of your church, of your city, of your province, and of your nation, and, and eventually into the, in the world. That, the worldwide church is called right now to set the atmosphere of this, of this world and to engage into the purposes of God. And what the atmosphere does, it causes uh, healing. It causes transformation. Tra the transforming power of God comes from the raining down from the heavens and, the, and, and, and coming upon the dry and parched lands that have been hurt for, uh, for <clears throat> thousands and annals of history. And most of us here are sitting here have 
have a history written out in our lives. And the only way that those things can be healed and transformed is, is by setting the atmosphere of your life. And if we don't deliberately set the atmosphere of our life, what's going to happen? The strongest default position is going to overpower your spiritual life. So when you are engaging into life, make sure that you walk in that presence of God. Let him set that atmosphere in your life. Because what will happen is we will get fooled and we'll get deceived and we'll let other things set the atmosphere and attitudes of our life. Many uh, years of uh, you know, history through, through our lives cause different things to happen in our lives to, in order to react and to, in order to um, deal and cope with situations that we encounter. And sometimes we don't know how to deal with them. Sometimes what happens, we default to different ways of, 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 of dealing with situations. I'll get a little bit more into that as, as, we, as we talk. But understand that the world today the world today in its natural position, if the people of God don't rise up, will automatically default to what happened over 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve came uh, to the conclusion that maybe there's something better uh, than what God can offer. And we find that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Where, you know, uh, God put, there's two trees in the Garden of Eden. One tree was the tree of life, and the other one was uh, the tree of the knowledge and, of good and evil. And what happened was, they're thinking like, I want to be like God. Right? In their head. But without realizing that God already made them like him. So here comes Satan into the, into the scene, and he says, listen, um, maybe God's holding out a little bit on you. And so what happens, they go into, uh, into that realm of disobedience, setting the atmosphere of creation till the time that God puts it right. So we see that the world right now is operating in that realm where everybody's looking after their own good. And then we're seeing the display of evil from, you know, from all corners of the world. And seeing that this is, this is what's setting the atmosphere in different nations. I mean, I, I could look through newsreels and newscasts for you. One... one um, I'm going, I'm going to actually show, uh, read this to you. One, one um, time back, uh, I think it was last, last week. I was, I was scrolling through, uh, I've got this app on CTV News, right? So here are the headlines for that one, one day. I can't give you the date because it was last week anyway. Here are some of the things. U.S. man arrested for killing and dismembering woman. Next newscast. Uh, bleached beauty debate lights up and Twitter lights up Twitter after Kenyan society's comment after Kenyan society's comments. So everybody's thinking, oh, this is an important thing, right? So here we go on some more. This is all the same day. Suspect arrest. Uh, suspect arrested after woman child found dead in parked car. Workers fired after abuse call, uh, caught on tape at BC Dairy Farm. I mean, how much bad news 
can we take? I think this world is ready for something good. I think, uh, you know, the, the, this world is ready for an answer. Or maybe, you know, maybe it's a good idea to put a lot of these news uh, companies out of business and have one, 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 one truth and one uh, newscast that reaches all that would be able to fix the world's problems. Unfortunately, until Jesus comes, these problems are going to be manifesting more and more and more. So we have a choice in life. How are we going to walk? What are we going to believe? Who, what are our reactions going to be? How are we going to set the atmosphere of our lives? All those things that, that come pressing at us from the world, how are we going to deal with it? Are we going to internalize all those things? Are we going to internalize truth? Are we going to internalize the presence of God? You see, the greatest thing that's going to change the atmosphere of this nation and of this world is his people rising up and walking in the presence of God that can, can transform lives and bring change into people individually. I mean, our churches are filled with people who don't have any answers. There's churches out there that are trying to find answers in programs. They're trying to find answer, answers in, in, in psychological um, doctrines. But I'm going to tell you that one moment in the presence of God can change everything. One moment in the presence of God can transform a life to something that was destroyed, to something that is new, and something that is, uh, that is, is full of life and restored. And one moment in the presence uh, of God can change a lifetime of hurts. If only we can come and see what God has for us. If only we can come see what what, what, can, what, what, the, what the heavens can, can provide for us in the presence of God, that he opens up the heavens like uh, though a song of the Lord came to We need to step into what God has given and, and provided for us and opened up for us. It's when we come to the point where we try to pry things open ourselves and they don't work. I mean, we've tried prying things open in our lives and trying to pry, you know, even, even to save somebody. We even pry into their lives. See, what happens is we, uh, by, by prying into their lives is where we're, we're putting judgment and condemnation into their lives rather pre than presenting the healing power of God. And we've, we've done a poor job historically as the church. I mean, that's evidenced even in nations and how... Uh, they've come and tried to uh, culturalize people instead of bringing them the gospel. Culturalizing doesn't work. Bringing them the truth and the presence of, a, of, a, of an all-powerful God that can deal with all your hurts and issues is what works. And most of us have suffered a lifetime of destructive events in historic proportions. Just to come to, uh, to a meeting uh, some Christians who, who tell you that, you know, you're a bad person. Where God wants to open up his arms and give you a big, big healing hug and say, I love you. See, that's what worship does. That's, an, that's what the presence of God does in your life. It brings you to the place where you can understand the hurts and pains that were inflicted upon vulnerable populations and people.
I know that because of some of the things that have gone through my life that weren't that great. In my life, you know, I, I could never understand why my parents acted the way they did. And how the reactions of World War II or the influence of the actions of World War II actually embedded into their lives and, and caused them to react and act the way they did. How they didn't know how to cope with life and deal with trauma and deal with things that um, were so beyond their comprehension. Like my mom was taken out of uh, her little village at 14 years old and put on wagon trains and sent into Germany into camp concentration camps. And suffering in, in, that, in, in that environment and almost laying to dead. And being rescued out of there by uh, someone who saw and cared for her and put her into a farm. And in that farm, they're waiting to see what a Ukrainian looked like. Right here. <laughs> Waiting to see what a Ukrainian looked like. Then they figure, well, what are we going to do with this Ukrainian? So they looked at, it, at her and called her a Schweinhund. A pig dog. Broken. Torn out of her family. Don't know what to do. Probably crying every night, chained to a garbage can. With stories saying that, uh, she said, you know, I would have to eat out of garbage cans. I'd be throwing things out. and That's the only way I could survive. Probably, you know, putting on this, this show, saying, you know, uh, and telling lies in order to survive. Not knowing what else to do. And seeing her in her adult years not knowing how to parent me. And I can remember sitting, you know, in certain situations uh, as a kid and looking at my mom and going, why are you doing this to me? You know, this hurts. And through life go going through um, even some thoughts of, of anger and and contempt, and saying, like, this person doesn't love me. Where in her heart, she does not know how to cope with life. See, life has this tendency to put on destructive forces of historical proportions, because all of us have a history, right? All of us come to the point wondering, why am I going through all this stuff? Why am I acting the way I'm acting? And knowing that God is there, and why, 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 is, why can't I change? Or why can't I deal with situations? Now, I, I can tell you now that even my... In, in the years that I was a pastor, it was hard to get through a lot of these things. You know, it's amazing how life's hurts prevent you from being authentic and real. What happens is you, you put on this, this mask and this face with a big smile on your face, but inside, you're, 
They're just destroyed. Authenticity has this way of uh, bringing you to a place of healing. I'm going to tell you right now. If you can be authentic with God and you say, God, listen, these are things I'm dealing with. I'm going to take this mask off my face and I'm going to be real. And see what he's going to do with you because the thing is, there's no room for fakeness in the atmosphere of your king. You see, Jesus can look right through you. And do you know that what? Hurting people can look right through you too. And the thing is, yeah, there are things in our lives that happen to us, but you know what? This is the course, the way the default setting of this world has been holding for over 6,000 years. And people say, why do bad things happen to me? Well, the default course has been set for 6,000 years. Evil is rampant in this world. And what happens is, when we don't get genuine with God and let him into our lives and start rearranging things in our lives and so that we can deal with all these things that are hammered at us and put that fake mask on, then it's going to continue. God is, God is calling his church to become real. You know, God is calling his church to come out of that self-centeredness of protective attitude. See, that's what happened to my mom. She became self-centered, and that was her coping mechanism. That she would be able to survive. Now, I'd be going like, Mom, you know, why are you like this? I, I'm not... I, why do you do the things you do? In fact, sometimes she would do things and, and uh, be so deceptive, but there's a reason for it. She's not an evil person. But she doesn't know how to deal with life. And it's been, you know, years of, of, of praying for her and saying, Mom, you know, I love you, and Jesus loves you. <laughs> Don't talk to me about that. Look at all the stuff I went through. Where was God when all that stuff happened? I remember telling the story of being in England, and, and uh, she had just a, a sliver of, of, of faith or something to hold on to, and she went to... Uh, a Catholic priest, I think it was, wanting to bring her baby and christen her baby or whatever, you know, they baptize or whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. So the guy said, or the priest said, are you Catholic? No. Well, there's no way that God's going to accept you here. And so coming out of that, you know, knowing that what this man of God said to her and rejected her, so what, what kind of a reaction she's, is she going to have to Christianity? In fact, what, I remember being saved the first time. I was so so happy, so energetic. My wife and I got saved together in church, you know, and, and uh, it was just unreal. We're, 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 we're ready to take on the world and going home and saying, hey, guess what happened to me? What? You mean they brainwashed you? I told you they're going to get you. I said, yeah, hallelujah, I'm washed. My brain is washed.
So you're going through years of this kind of, you know, turmoil, hang, trying to hang on to a little bit of hope. A little bit of a something, you know what I mean? And I remember even God calling us into the ministry and, and how difficult that was to navigate through them, with them. Even in 1991, my dad died. And he denounced my Christianity. He says, I'll never forgive you for turning away from your family. That's the last thing my dad told me. But I sat there and I remember praying over him and reading the word to him and, and just saying, God, you know, be merciful on my dad. Dad, I love you. And God loves you. And then, uh, uh, and then I found out that my aunt from the Ukraine was, was, was flown over at that time. And then I found out that she was reading the word to him and praying for him. Some things I know I you know, you find out after, right? And who knows? But that's in God's hands. Not my hands. You know, the, the most dangerous position you can get into is when you start judging people. But the other thing, too, you know, through those years, I remember the turmoil that even my mom was facing trying to find love in different places. And some of the things that uh, we've even found out today, uh, just some of the things that she was trying to do to appease her pain. But now she's laying in a bed at the Royal Alex Hospital stricken with cancer. In, and, you know, just searching in myself, trying to figure things out. But, you know, every time I come across her, I deliberately tried to set the atmosphere of our meeting or our relationship. Then one day uh, last week, we're sitting down, uh, Carol and I. I remember taking her into the hospital before. She says, I want to live. I want to live. The doctor had come in. He says, how can I help you? I, I want to live. And just full of fear, wondering what's going to happen next in, in her. And Carol and I sat down, and I says, Mom, are you, are you afraid? Are you scared? She says, yeah. It's amazing when you have nothing left, and you know that all the money in the world that you've ever had, all the possessions you've had before, all the ideals you've had before, that made up your life don't matter anymore. But there's one more looming thing ahead of you, and that's inevitable death. And all of us have to deal with it. Eventually, we need to go home. Unless the Lord comes before that, of course. I'd rather have that part. <laughs> I'm waiting for Jesus to come <laughs> and empower his church to, to get to the place that we need to be. And right there, I, I'm talking to my mom, and I'm saying, Mom, don't be afraid. God loves you so much. She looked at me and looked away. I, and I turned her head, and I looked in her eyes. I said, Mom. And she turned away. I said, Mom. Put your eyes back on me. Look at me. It's something with eye contact. You know that? God loves you so much. And we prayed. And my wife led her to the Lord. I'm going to say to you, don't give up hope. 
in your loved ones. Have hope. No matter what you've gone through in your life, what kind of default pos uh, position things are in, that you are an overcomer. Through all things, you, you can overcome. Romans 10, 13, 17 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. But how can they, they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? I'm saying to you that, you know, maybe one reason you don't have people saved in your family is because he haven't said anything to them. Or if you don't have people in your family who are saved, you know, they, they see a lifestyle that doesn't have that atmosphere of the presence of God. We need to examine ourselves and who we are and how we react to people and how we present, you know, the living word. He is living. He's alive in you. He wants to bring that life into them. It's that evaporation of praise and worship in the presence of God that will rain down not only on your life but on people around you. You know, life isn't just about yourself. I mean, if it's a self-centered life, it's not going to go too far. It'd be pretty boring to me. God wants to expand your thoughts and, your, and, and, your, and who you are and how you're going to influence your own life, but that's not just for you. I'm telling you, it's more about everybody else than it's about you. Because Jesus, if it was all about him, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. He, he would have uh, uh, yielded to what Satan was saying. Because what Satan wanted to do is focus in on him. You can do this. You can do that. The kings, kingdoms of this world can be yours if he can only bow down to me. You can, you can turn that stone into bread any time. Do it. You know, there's kingdoms of the world. You know, they're all for you. And if only you would just bow down to Satan, he would say to you. But I'm going to say, stand up into your place. Do what Jesus did and, and rebuke those, those self-centeredness or self-centeredness that, that, that tries to take you into that self-preservation mode. Because because Satan knew in his flesh that Jesus was weak. He even says that he was, you know, he got his, to the place where his flesh was weak. He needed to overcome that. It's that war against the flesh and the spirit that rages on in, inside every one of us. That tries to take over our lives. And Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from me hearing, that is hearing the good news about Christ. And we need to be those people that set that atmosphere of good news. Because there's enough bad news going on around there. Life is bombarding us every day. And wants to to have us focus in on that. Where do you think all those newsreels are going? They want you to focus on it. Not only does it give them good ratings, but it also wants to turn your attention to what is going on and just go, oh, and it will, I put fear into the lives of people. That's it. Whoever said that. Colossians 1.11. Oh, sorry. Revelations 22.10. Revelation 22.10. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in the book. 
or this book, for the time is near. And now the word of prophecy is coming out and declaring yeah, the coming of the Lord and how the Lord is, is, is uh, calling to his church to become who she needs to be in order to rise up in this time that we're in. He said, let one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. And, I, and I, it's not, I want to put, put something in here for you, a little bit, a little clarification. We're talking about the heart intent. The heart that rejects, rejects God. The spiritual forces that are involved with that. But we also see here that, that uh, the prophecy goes out and says, let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. And that's the, the, uh, the presence of the Almighty God within his church. The ministry of Jesus being, being released upon his church onto this world. So there's going to come a time that the evidence of, uh, of the separation is going to be more and more evident. And God's people are called to rise up and be who, are they're, who they're made to be. Colossians chapter 1 also says, this. We also pray that you be strengthened with his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. Always thanking the Father, he has enabled you to, to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm going to say to you that all of us have a history. All of us come to Jesus with stuff. But Jesus takes us and he transforms us. That presence of God transforms us from the kingdom of light, uh, from darkness to the kingdom of light. It's the work of God. Because he purchased us, he purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Each one of us can stand before humanity and say, I've been there. That's the authenticity that God is looking for in his church. You know, that's the greatest thing that can minister to anyone. I, I, was, I was sitting at uh, being, trying to be counseled by someone who was a funeral director. And that was the most painful thing in the world because you know how the, you can tell that things are scripted. Right? It's all a sales pitch. And I'm going, Carol, I need to get out of here. My mom is still alive and she wants to sell me a coffin. You know, it's just, it messes with your head, you know? And I'm thinking, that this is too scripted. This person doesn't care. We can't be at the point where we know so much scripture that we script ourselves without being authentic. You know, there comes a time when we need to be real. And we need to be real. Don't try to appease or patronize anybody when they're in pain.
God works through genuine hearts. Because that's the only way he can get in to a hurting vessel. And that's true because Jesus took himself and gave himself for the cross. Because Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we cannot see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world, and this is what we're up against. We were up against these forces who are trying to set the default position of your life. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body, for he is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, is pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. So note that everything in you, because when you come to God before you're saved, you come as... Um, You come, as the Roman says. Can you tell me what it is? An opposition. You come as an enemy of God. But he reconciles you to himself. That's powerful. You come in opposition to God in that standing. He comes and redeems you. And this is happening to my mother. All these years and all this pain, thinking, why does God do this to me. She even said to me before she was saved, she says, God is punishing me. Why is he punishing me? I, I, after all I've been through, he's punishing me. But now she's redeemed. Not only that, she is set free and she sets the atmosphere of where she's at. Physically. Everything is reconciled through Jesus Christ to himself. There's no reconciliation if you don't surrender to God. It's a surrender. And he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who are once far away from God. You are his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Wow, the power of God. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it and don't drift away from the assurance you've received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. And we're here to proclaim it. Proclaim it. 
Proclaim it. Don't just proclaim it here. Proclaim it outside these walls. Proclaim it in your lives. Set the atmosphere of transformation in, the li- in your life. That transforming power is going to be working in you continually, bringing you to new positions, taking you and dealing with, your, uh, with the, the stuff of your history and being able to sp- spill out and set the atmosphere and rain upon areas of life that you couldn't even just dream of. Let God work through you, in you and through you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, the healing power of God. Hallelujah. The healing power of God can spill into generations of hurt and cut off the rights of the enemy in people. The healing power of God can breathe in new life into dead areas. The healing power of God will set free the captives and heal the broken hearted. The healing power of God will proclaim liberty to those in prisons. healing power of God. The healing power of God. The healing power of God can reveal issues that have been unresolved for many, many years. Even when we think we've resolved Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just work on your people now. Lord, I just proclaim liberty right now and freedom. Oh, by the grace of God, would you move, oh God? Hallelujah, Jesus. You bring life, oh God. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's just rise up today. Let's stand up and just rise up. We'll open up the altars too if you want. If you need prayer, if you need a touch from the Lord. If there's some issues that need to be dealt with, let's deal with them. Lord, I just pray that you would just open the heavens for your people, God. Touch them with your grace. Touch them with your mercy. Father, if there's any unresolved issue or pain. Father God, help us to become real with it.
because it's ultimately not just about ourselves, but Father, there's a world that needs us because you operate through your church, oh God. But first, Father, I just pray that we can deal with our stuff. Oh, presence, the presence of God. Fill this place, oh God. Holy Spirit, fill this place, oh God. Touch the hearts of your people. Heal the hearts of your people. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Lord, you're saying, Pray that the masks be stripped off in the name of Jesus. And we can come to you. We can come to you, Lord, as the real us, the real me. No place hidden. Lord, I just pray that you bring all things into the light, O oh God. I just pray that you bring all things into the light, O oh God. Lord, I'm just tired of trying to work it out myself. Lord, put your identity on your people today. Your identity, O oh God. Lord, all other identities fall to the ground and I cut you off in the name of Jesus. I cut you off in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, I pray that your identity and your seal come upon your people today. Your seal, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. All things have come to deceive and to draw you away from God, I cut them off in the name of Jesus. Let all spiritual forces yield to the name of, of Jesus today. Name above all names. Lord of Lord, kings, King of Kings, I command you to subject to the Lord of Lord and King of Kings today. And I release the power of God into you. the Holy Spirit into the lives of your people. Teach them, empower them. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, a broken and contrite heart. He will not despise you. Lord, I just pray that you move through your brokenness, through the brokenness of the people. That's how you move. He doesn't move through your strengths. He moves through your brokenness. He doesn't move through scripts. He moves through brokenness. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. Be not ashamed that you're broken. But stand up in the righteousness of God and take on his righteousness and his seal. Take on his name today. Because he has opened the ways for you. He has opened the, the heavens for you. He is the one who sets things right. He is the one who moves in your life. Open yourself to him today. Lord, I just pray your glory be in your people. glory of the Lord inhabits 
sacrifice and brokenness. Oh, Lord. Sacrifice and brokenness. Heavy weight is on Jesus, it's not on you. Jesus doesn't need any martyrs. But Jesus wants a surrendered soul. Surrender comes when you've dealt with reality that you can't win. When you, you can't win on your own. The Lord would say to you, come to me. You are, who are burdened and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Sweep over us, O God. Just sweep over us. So don't break up any ministry time that the Lord is doing to you. We'll leave the tithe and offering baskets in the back so we don't disrupt the moving of the Holy Spirit today. So as you leave, you can leave your tithes and offerings. If you have a basket in the back, you don't mind somebody setting, setting that up. Just going to, let's just surrender to God here today. We're not going to rush if you need to leave, you can do that. But you're going to miss out on what God's going to do here. Father, thank you, Jesus. say today God is looking for a surrendered vessel 
Let's just surrender ourselves to him tonight.